Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ivy Love, and I'm a policy analyst with the Center on Education and Skills here at New America. First, I want to thank you all for being here with us today. We're so grateful to have you with us as we discuss how best to support our students during this really strange and difficult time of a pandemic that we're living in. But to that point, I want to acknowledge the grief and anger and fear that folks are feeling today and to acknowledge the violence that is, is being leveled at Black people today and has been leveled at Black people for years, decades, and centuries. And before we begin, I want to call all of us, especially the white folks who are on this webinar with us today, to uproot white supremacy in our curriculum, in our classrooms, in our colleges, and to take a deep look inside and uproot white supremacy in ourselves. So let's all in these 90 minutes that we're here together as we listen to and engage in today's webinar. Use everything that we hear to work for racial justice and to carry that with us moving forward. At 345, that's Eastern time, so the midpoint of today's webinar, we will be joining with others across the country to pause in silence for one minute to honor the life of George Floyd. So with that said, I also want to offer a few housekeeping items before we get into the content today. The recording of this webinar, um, as Angela mentioned, will be available later. We will post this slide deck. You'll notice that several um, presenters have links in their slides, and those will be made available once we upload this full slide deck to the event webpage. Additionally, as folks on the webinar um, who are presenters mention additional resources that didn't make it into their slides, we'll also be collecting those and we'll make those available on the event webpage after today's webinar. Two more things. I want to invite you all to share your thoughts and connect with each other on Twitter as well using this hashtag CC online that you'll see at the bottom of our slides. Um, and just to encourage you again, as questions come up over the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit those um, using the Q&A function. Our events team is going to collect those, and then my colleague Iris Palmer will moderate a discussion of your questions during the last portion of the webinar. So we have a wonderful group of panelists here today um, with a wide range of expertise on past lessons and current practices that can inform how we're responding to the COVID crisis and all the uncertainty that it introduces using open educational resources. So our presenters all have great expertise to share. Several of them were connected in some way to a large federal investment in community colleges that was made in response to the Great Recession around 10 years ago. So I do just want to share a little bit about that recession era federal investment in community colleges before we go any further. The TACT program, that is the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Program, uh, there's an acronym for you, um, which our team has been researching for the past few years, really highlighted the potential of community colleges to form part of economic recovery efforts. So as the economy worsened in the Great Recession, people turned to community colleges to access training to help them get a different job or more security in their current work. So TACT funded either single community colleges or consortia of institutions to do many things. Um, they could build new programs, enhance student services, create openly licensed curricula, which is the focus of, of today's webinar, and more. And with such a large investment of nearly $2 billion, uh, a looming question this many years after it was, did it work? Did it achieve its aims? Uh, and our team found that it did. Along with our partners at Bragg and Associates, we at New America conducted a meta-analysis which found that participants intact were around twice as likely as non-participants uh, to complete their programs and around 30% more likely to have some positive labor market outcome, um, which is either to get a job or a wage gain after their participation. We also conducted research on a few other um, key strategies that grantees use to support their students intact, um, including enhanced coaching and advising in the position uh, often known as a navigator, and the use of prior learning assessment to accelerate student progress. So today we've convened folks, some of whom are connected to TACT or some who are connected to community colleges more broadly because while the situation where we find ourselves now with COVID is truly different from the Great Recession in many ways, 
we still feel that community colleges really are central to the recovery from the crisis, as well as community support and well being. So what folks learned then is informing practice now. And that's what we want to share to with you today is what practices are really supporting students at community colleges across the country today. So as I hand it over to our presenters, we'll just hear some words of wisdom from them to help us all weather this storm and to offer students, faculty, staff, um, what they need through open educational resources. So with that, I am very pleased to pass the mic to our first presenter, Maria Fee. Thank you, Ivy, and thanks for that background on TACT. It's, a, it's an impressive history of work that went on across the nation. I'm Maria Feith, and um, I was a TACT project director at one time, but in 2016, I moved over to the California State University in the role of partnership development and worked with the Skills Commons team to develop the repository for the TACT collections coming out of the colleges. Skills Commons um, was designed to host all of the open materials being created and vetted under TAC, the TACT initiative by those 700 community colleges, universities, and their employer partners. The thousands of material items on Skills Commons all have Creative Commons licensing, which means anyone can freely download and use or revise any of it as they wish. By design, no costs are associated with downloading and using its content. All that is required is that you give attribution to the originators, and we can even help you with that part of the process. Skills Commons is designed for easy searches based on keywords, occupations, industries, credentials, material types. Users can also interact with our industry wheel, which is a tool that uses the NAICS codes to, to better pinpoint materials. The open materials organized on Skills Commons continues to be relevant to our users, and we know that based on our analytics. This site has realized uh, over four and a half million downloads and views since its inception, and the average is about 200,000 per quarter. So that tells us people are still finding this work to be pertinent. And you can go to the next slide, Ivy. Thank you. You want to thank you. There you are. Good. Our most recent development is this teaching and learning on site, uh, online site. It's a COVID response resource for those who might be new to online teaching or learning. It includes full courses like hygiene, safety, infection control, as well as a plethora of goodies for CTE instructors. There are tips and tools, course links, connections to commercial tech free online resources and accessibility help. Just as with all of the Skills Commons material, these teaching and learning resources are free to download and revise and use as needed. And next slide, please, Ivy. Skills Commons successfully partners with organizations to develop affordable ways of managing materials through customized portals and repositories. One example is our partnership with the Ohio Manufacturers Association. The OMA leadership team identified five priority need occupations there in Ohio, and through a vetting process performed by an editorial board made up of Ohio employers, over 80 courses were deemed worthy of the OMA stamp of excellence in engineering, industrial maintenance, machining, and a couple of others. And based on OMA's identified needs, we also added some point and click collections like soft skills and safety, women in sustainable employment, as well as one of our premier courses that we call Jumpstart to Successful Instruction. Jumpstart is a course divided into three sections with each section holding about a dozen interactive models. Each model is designed to promote high student engagement. It's self-paced, it takes about an average of 20 minutes to complete and, offer, and offers progress monitoring and remediation. The full course is designed to support industry experts who may be new to teaching and can help get new instructors up and running before the first week of classes. This is perfect for CTE instructors at all levels. Uh, the Colorado Community College Online Learning Object Repository, boy, that's a mouthful, is a good example of a customized closed system collection that can be ex expanded by faculty or in their instructional designers. So Skills Commons built, host, and maintains a repository, and the Colorado system continues to develop its contents. The CC Online faculty access the private collection through specialized logins. 
the skills common team offers uh, technical assistance and we, we also offer some customized training packages as they need. Skills Commons showcases, um, highlights some of the collection's strongest materials. This would be a good place for you to start if you're not familiar with Skills Commons at all. Um, and I will make sure that Ivy has that link directly. Each of these, uh, sorry, the users can peruse high quality vetted OER material in healthcare, advanced manufacturing, IT, energy, construction, hospitality, dev ed, and others. So for your convenience, I've added links to each of the images within the slides and uh, no login is required on skillscommons.org. So if you have questions along the way, you can reach us at connect at skillscommons.org. We're happy to help you navigate this very large collection of OER. And uh, we're here to answer questions today if, that's, if, if that seems helpful. And with that, Ivy, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Maria, thank you so, so much for sharing these valuable resources, um, especially, oh dear, I have gotten out of my presentation. Let me start that back up again. There we go. Um, thank you so much again for sharing with us. Um, yes, we will be sure that everyone has access to the links that you mentioned um, and can get connected to Skills Commons um, to make the best use pop possible of all these wonderful resources. And with that, I want to pass the mic over to our friend Una Daly. Hi, Una, are you there? You might be muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Can hear you just fine. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Ivy, for um, uh, turning it over to me and for inviting me to come and, and talk with folks today. So the Community College Consortium for OER, um, next slide is great, is um, a community of practice for open education. We were founded over a decade ago with the vision to remove barriers to student success. Uh, through cost, while inspiring faculty to innovate and expand on the open access mission of public two-year colleges. And our founder, uh, Dr. Martha Cantor, who's now the executive director of College Promise, she, she has a phrase that I always love. She says, we, uh, we have the top 100% of students. And so we serve um, what is often called the non-traditional student, but is actually um, the majority of the students at community colleges, and there is a great need. Over the last decade, we've grown quite a bit. Um, we have uh, members in 35 states, uh, varying from small rural colleges to um, urban, suburban, and system and statewide um, organizations. And in fact, um, we had uh, many members participate in the TACT grants um, and upload materials to Skills Commons. And also, I'm very pleased to say there's three other speakers on today who are members um, of our consortium and really contribute to the value. So um, our mission um, hasn't changed that much in a decade. Uh, it's still about um, expanding access to high quality OER, supporting faculty, and empowering leadership um, in order to ensure equity and student success. Um, and we're actually part of a larger system, the um, Open Education Global, which has members in 40 countries. And we've been a member of theirs since uh, 2011. Um, and I, I put a little picture of our, our homepage here, um, and these um, are uh, lists of our monthly webinars. We just had um, one yesterday on uh, user-friendly OER course design with over 300 registrants. This is a very hot topic right now. Um, we've been running a, um, for two and a half years, a um, blog series on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and how open education can support that. And um, as you can see in the top right there, we, our most recent blog post was from uh, Tanja Connerly, professor of sociology at San Jacinto College, one of our member colleges. We also share student impact stories. So this is all about our members and the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, and um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about our quote unquote non-traditional students um, as the community as is often referred to uh, our students, I think um, they have been affected more by the pandemic than what would be considered traditional students. We know that um, 
over 60% of our students who attend full-time work uh, while they're attending school, about 29%, almost 30% are first generation students, 20% are students with disabilities. Um, so we know that cost is a big issue for our students. And um, next slide, please. So when um, the pandemic occurred, um, we started reaching out to our members and vice versa and there was a big pivot to online resources and so with our community we started collecting these resources and um, now have a, a a set of resources that are organized by student by faculty by institution um, about what other folks are doing um, and the really high quality um, reusable items that people can bring to their college. We also pivoted around um, our webinars that were coming up. So we have monthly webinars. So in April, we had a webinar on open pedagogy, which is really looking to engage our students in their education and, and helping them to persist um, throughout uh, not only difficult times financially prior to the pandemic, but also today. Uh, while they're going through this really tough time where many of our students have lost their jobs and are um, no doubt um, also um, facing housing issues. Um, and in last month, we had a webinar on um, how OER can help you create resilience at your, uh, at your campus. And we focused on um, enrollment, um, accessibility, universal design for learning, um, how you might use fair use, and how to make choices around these free ed tech products that um, floated around right after the pandemic. How do you make those choices about um, materials that might be free today, but as soon as the pandemic is over, we'll of course go back to having a cost basis. And so how can, how can faculty make um, good decisions around um, considering OER, which um, is free online to students and will continue to be free online into the future. Uh, the other thing we did was we published a number of um, inspiring or extraordinary stories of COVID response. And we really wanted to inspire people with all the really difficult news um, over the last few months. And here is just a really brief smattering of those, which is we, Raritan College in New Jersey, their manufacturing, their college advanced manufacturing team um, got together and started to produce masks for local hospitals. We have the Open RN program out of Chippewa Valley in Wisconsin, who were sharing all of their um, nursing simulations. So for those nursing programs that couldn't meet face to face, which was most of them, there were nursing simulations online to support that. Um, laptop programs, um, et cetera. Um, one of our colleges, and you're going to hear about this in a minute, um, converted some of their face-to-face -face workshop dollars that were supposed to occur this summer to emergency grants for faculty to get training on OER so that they could adopt those. So this time of year, so it's really some wonderful ideas, and I, I really encourage you to go to that site, um, and I'll provide the link to, to Ivy because I don't think it's there. Um, so this time of year in May, we always do an annual survey with our members, and we ask them, you know, what has what has changed for you um, with the um, with the pandemic? Has this changed your priorities? And um, Overwhelmingly, they said, no, OER is more important than ever. Yes, timing can be an issue. Um, urgency of getting everyone online, of course, took precedence over the last few months. But what we can look at is we can look at integrating um, OER training into professional development around going online. Those digital resources that are OER um, can be very easily integrated into courses. And so figuring out how we can um, work with other programs um, that are focused on professional development and training for our faculty. Um, we're really concerned about student equity and persistence. We know that the pandemic has not affected all populations equally and there's been a, a disproportionate effect on our, once again, non-traditional students, but which are our traditional students at, uh, or the majority of our students at community colleges. So that keeping the costs down, keeping um, instructional materials free is, we believe is going to help our students stay connected, stay enrolled and persist throughout this period. Um, 
And finding strategic funding sources is another thing that uh, we've been having discussions with our members about. Uh, remember that um, OER and the adoption of OER to help our students and inspire innovation in our faculty is very, it's very closely linked to guided pathways, um, the national movement to guided pathways at community colleges uh, with student equity um, um, efforts and um, and also with workforce um, as well. We, many of our students need to find uh, new jobs. New jobs are be, gonna be created post the pandemic and um, the Perkins Five money um, can be used for OER. It's specifically written into the legislation. And there's also the CARES dollars that are coming through, where, which are another option. As, as colleges are pivoting to online, how can they use those funds um, to help their students? Um, and um, one way, of course, is to reduce the costs for students by um, providing OER that will be free into the future. And so I, I think I probably have just about used up my time. So I just wanted to say, you know, please um, join the conversation with us if this is if these are areas of interest to you. If you go to our website, cccoer.org, under Get Involved, you can join our email list. You can check out our calendar. All of our webinars are open to the education community, and um, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you for listening. Thank you so, so much, Una, for that. Um, we've been hearing about the CCC OER listserv from everyone we talked to. So um, I'll put in another plug for that um, and for all the awesome resources, webinars, and more that um, they offer. Um, so thank you, Una. Sharon, we're so glad to have you with us. And I would love to pass the mic over to you. Great. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, I think this has been really exciting. Um, I guess if you go to the next slide, I sort of wrote out um, who I am. Um, my name is Sharon Liu, and I'm a senior policy advisor at the U.S. Department of Education. I work in the Office of Educational Technology, and what we are charged to do is think about the national vision and the strategy for how educational technology of all sorts, or technology generally, um, can be used in education to transform teaching and learning um, to promote the awareness and effective use of technologies by our uh, stakeholders, including states and districts and post-secondary educational institutions, as well as workforce tra training providers. Um, and also to just sort of think about how across the federal, um, across our agency and other federal agencies, um, we can use technology effectively so that um, education can be available for all students. Um, and um, I guess I think I got invited because um, I used to work um, at the Department of Labor on, the, on a little program called TACT. And I'm so excited actually to see all the names um, of the attendees. Um, maybe you all are not as excited and you think I'm haunting you for your quarterly reports still, but it was such a pleasure to be working with everyone and just to, to see the fruits of all of your labor um, um, as like time has gone and to think about how um, like our investment really did actually make an impact for people has been a really exciting thing for me. So thank you for having me. Um, uh, would you mind going to the next slide, please? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, not about specific items at the moment, but I think that what I'll try to do is um, give a general framework for why um, does the federal government um, think open education and open licensing generally is really important. And um, essentially it's the sentence that is on the bottom of the slides, like, um, you know, the Department of Education in particular is, um, a, I guess, a re an offshoot of the civil rights era movements. And the, when it was established, it was really to provide opportunity for all students, regardless of their background. And open education is an opportunity for us to think about promoting equity and especially benefiting resource poor stakeholders. Um, and it allows us to do this in a number of ways. So, um, you know, TACT was a $2 billion investment by, by a department, but, you know, that kind of money doesn't come around all of the time. And then so we have some questions about like, well, with all of the investments that we do make, how can we broaden its impact? Right, so how can we help to scale our investments um, by either reducing the duplication, encouraging diversity of the ideas and the, you know, the products being created, um, 
or is it like making sure or providing assistance in helping um, products be sh shared as broadly as possible? Um, so for example, like teaching and learning resources being put on a website like Skills Common and then being accessed by any number of individuals. Um, and is there an element of it that involves removing barriers to access? Um, so, you know, at um, the Department of Education and the Department of Labor, there are many different kinds of training curricula produced. There are assessments, technology enabled tools. But the question is like, do the general public know that these things are available to them? And if they knew about them, would they feel comfortable accessing them and using them? Or would they feel like there's additional permission that they need to seek? And we also think that there's a, an important role in sort of accelerating innovation. So stimulating the, develop, derivative, the development of derivative works, um, creating products on top of the openly licensed materials um, and thinking about how that has grown and um, like sort of um, the creative ways that the things that we have um, funded have been used. Um, would you uh, please go to the next slide? And a couple of other things just on the content themselves. Um, this is an excellent way of making sure that the content is always relevant and high quality. Um, we all know on this call how quickly um, the work skills needed for workforce change. Um, and as um, community colleges and, you know, training providers um, look at different ways that they can adapt the things that they already have, um, you know, an open license allows people to just take the materials and make any sort of either regional adjustments, adjustments that um, update the description of the skills or the types of skills being offered by courses um, and to make sure that you know if there are materials that aren't sort of high quality anymore that they can be uh, um, like fixed or adjusted at any time and at the same time i think there's a huge um, role that open licenses play in empowering educators so thinking about um, an instructor in a course or a teacher in a classroom being able to take control and say like, yes, this is what I would like to teach to my students or this is what my students need um, and really just supporting them as they are the creative professionals that they are. Um, so um, I'll give you an example. And this is the question um, that I think, um, did it work, right? So I'll just give a, this is a tact round one grant that, um, was run out of the Washington State Community Technical College System um, with their workforce partner, Boeing. Um, and it's actually like in the course of creating all of this aerospace and um, curriculum, we um, got a request from um, a USAID grantee that was um, interested in figuring out how to make that same um, content available for their technical high school system um, because they have an aerospace cluster and they reached out because they asked us like, hey, you know, can we just take some of your material? What permissions do we need? Um, who do we ask for, um, you know, copyrights for? Do we have to like pay royalties? But we were able to say like, you know, all of these are available under a Creative Commons license. And so please take and adjust and, you know, translate into Spanish, add um, additional layers underneath the career pathway so that they stack into the community college level and adjust according to um, the different, um, the specifics of the partners in your aerospace cluster. So we thought that was a really exciting project and an excellent um, example of impact that openly licensed materials can have. Um, would you mind going to that next one? Okay. Um, these are two from the Department of Education's grant. Um, the first in the world grant program that was available for um, institutions of higher ed in FY14 and 15. Um, just a quick, you know, all of the materials um, that were available made through the First in the World grant program were openly licensed as well. Um, and a key example of that is um, the University System of Maryland and their math initiative. Um, they were redesigning a pathway and they were able to, um, with our funding, add a statistics pathway so that not only did the system institutions, but the community colleges in Maryland like could, they could access the material. And we also have other programs um, like our education technology media and materials program that is um, funded through the in Individuals with Disabilities Act. Um, you know, one of our grantees, Benedek Tech runs a diagram center to make materials that are for individuals with visual disabilities um, available to the public and freely available. Um, 
So I guess I'll just stop here for the moment um, with these last two things that are sort of up upcoming opportunities. So um, one of the things to note is that um, as time passed, um, in addition to um, the specific grant programs that I just mentioned, um, the requirement to use open licenses became um, department-wide for both the Department of Labor as well as the Department of Education, so that anyone who receives any money through the departments, either of the departments through a discretionary process, um, has to openly license the materials that they produce um, and to make them, and in the case of the Department of Education, make them discoverable to the public. Um, this includes a very important investment that we have currently. Um, I just, I wrote this, this is the CARES Act Education Stabilization Fund. It's a discretionary fund. Um, right now it's um, the K-12 to version is um, open for competition, so I'm a little bit limited in what I can talk about. But one of the things that um, is within the K-12 CARES Fund is Absolute Priority 2, which is virtual learning and course access programs with the goal of making materials available to all students, especially those um, impacted gr the most by COVID, um, so that students can have these materials at like low cost or no cost. Um, and this is an excellent example of um, how open educational resources could come into um, a lot of states. Um, there is an, a sort of a re rethinking um, education and workforce version, the sort of post-secondary workforce version of the CARES funding that will be um, an additional 100 50-ish million dollars that is coming soon, and that will also have this open licensing requirement. Um, also coming in the fall of 2020 is another round of the open textbook pilot program, and there will be approximately $7 million for institutions of higher education. Um, I was glad that Una mentioned OpenRN, um, Chippewa State, uh, sorry, Chippewa Valley is actually one of our um, second round grantees, as well as um, the Arizona State University um, Open active textbook um, project that includes also Maricopa and Ivy Tech and Miami Dade, um, as well as Libra Text, who was our first round grantee. So we have um, a lot of excellent opportunities specifically around open education. Um, we hope that you all take advantage of these and continue the great work. And um, I'll just close by saying if you have any questions about any of these, please feel free to ask me. I'm happy to talk about them at any time. Thank you, Sharon. Um, really interesting to learn about the federal perspective there. I learned a lot from your presentation and um, we are happy to, um, we, I don't have a full contact slide at the end, but we're happy to connect you um, with print presenters. Um, feel free to reach out, uh, reach out to us here at New America and we can, we can do that. Um, I will hand the mic over to James in just one second. I want to remind everyone who, um, and to, to point out for those who may have joined late, at 345, which is in about nine minutes, uh, we will be pausing uh, in solidarity with folks across the country to take one minute of silence and reflection um, in honor of George Floyd. Um, so uh, James, I'm going to hand to you, and I know we'll, you and I can both keep our eyes on the clock, okay? Thanks very much, Ivy. Is the audio good? The audio is perfect. You're good to go. All right. Thank you so much, Ivy. Thanks, everybody. James Galapagos Clegg, College of the Canyons. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, at College of the Canyons, which is located in uh, the greater Los Angeles County area, we are one of the 114 California community colleges. And as Una mentioned, we're proud to serve the top 100% of students. Um, this, as by way of introduction, I'm an academic dean, which means I get to lurk, work alongside our library folks, our tutoring center, our online education team. And in our institution, online education is the, uh, the department or the unit that manages our OER, our Open Educational Resources uh, Initiative. Uh, as you uh, dive into OER, you'll find that uh, OER lives in a lot of different places on the org chart. It might be your center for teaching, it might be uh, professional development, it might be li your academic library, uh, and or it might be your online education team in, in our case. Um, I also have the, have had the good fortune of working with, with a lot of grants and working with a lot of friends who, who are also here on the webinar today. Uh, I've had the good fortune to be a lead on various state and national OER projects again with many of the folks who are here and and hopefully uh, those of you who are new to the OER world you can get a sense that the OER community is very welcoming and very friendly and very supportive so uh, reach out to any of us we'd, we'd love to welcome new people um, 
Uh, quick word about my institution, College of the Canyons. We're a medium largish institution in my world. That uh, means we serve around 32,000 students per year. We offer students around 170 degree and certificate programs. We are a proud Hispanic serving institution. And pre-COVID-19, uh, around 25% of our schedule of classes was online. Uh, of course, that's now one, well, probably 99% of our schedule is, is online. So our uh, incredible online education team has gone from serving 25% of our faculty and students to supporting 100% in a very short time. I think that many of you can identify with that. Um, we were quite fortunate to be able to uh, develop and deploy a survey of our students in the, uh, I think about one month into the transition to remote. Uh, and uh, ask them some key questions. And uh, I'm sharing some of that key data here. 62% uh, of our students said, gosh, we're not able to learn as well post COVID uh, for a lot of different reasons. Not necessarily when we drill down into the data, it's not necessarily because uh, they, they didn't like the online class format, but rather we, we, we think that it's the transition, the rapid transition and on the part of our faculty, sometimes not having had enough opportunity to uh, be fully trained and prepare their instructional materials to make the pivot from face-to-face uh, -face class to online. Uh, we also found overwhelmingly our students said, oh yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with technology. That, that's, that's really not the issue. The issue is uh, getting access to the technology these days. Um, I used to use the computer labs at the, at the college. Uh, or I sure I have a computer at home, but I'm sharing it with five family members now and, and half of those family members are obligated to use the computer all day long for work. So how the heck am I supposed to do my homework now? Um, we also found that students identified the top issues that they're dealing with as too many distractions, going back to whether it's the, uh, uh, just the, the anxiety in the world or uh, the aforementioned uh, battle over who gets to access the computer now. Um, and also the mental health, 59% of our students said the top, their top barrier to succeeding right now is mental health. So holy smokes, that's a, that's a, a significant uh, input for I, not only my institution, but I think all of us. So I encourage you all, if you have not yet done this at your institutions to please uh, begin your planning uh, for next semester with, uh, with the student voice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to share a couple of uh, strategies that, that we dove into or that, well, I, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't overstate it, that, that emerged as we frantically tried to keep our, our heads above water, I think, as, as many uh, of you also have done. Um, first of all, we uh, were able to partner across the institution. We uh, found that the silos magically disappeared. Um, our faculty uh, collaborated wonderfully with our online ed team and we collaborated wonderfully with our IT folks uh, just to get the dang job done to expand our licenses for Zoom to uh, get people trained to teach online. Uh, another really great example was the, the collaboration between, between our student services arm of the institution which undertook to uh, provide students with laptops and our college foundation which uh, kindly and generously stepped in to help fund that initiative uh, when uh, the student services folks ran out of money to buy all the laptops for our students. Um, and, uh, and of course, this, this ties into, the, you know, this transition ties into access to instructional materials. It's not just a matter of getting, getting faculty transitioned or getting students transitioned to using Zoom or using Canvas or, or using a learning management system now. It's also a matter of them continuing to have access to learning materials. Uh, probably a number of you have thought about uh, how, how the heck do we make sure that students have their textbooks now or other instructional materials. And I would encourage you to act now, keep your students learning, but also think about what happens then, what happens next. Um, we need those instructional materials now, but there, are, there may be consequences later. Uh, we see in the library world, uh, many, many, many uh, private commercial vendors of, of, of e-resources and e-books and uh, course course packs uh, um, are, uh, have waived access fees to institutions and students for the duration of the spring semester. Oh, how, how generous of them. Uh, but uh, what uh, we know will happen uh, is that uh, once the students and faculty are accustomed to those free resources, the fees will be turned back on. 
faculty will have built their courses around those new materials and it will be difficult to extract the faculty uh, from uh, those resources, uh, those free resources they built their courses around, and we will have exposed our students to the uh, data surveillance and exploitation of those uh, commercial uh, commercial products. So be very, I, I really encourage you to be cautious about uh, the steps you take now to help your students now. There may very well be consequences later. Nevertheless, uh, let's go back to basics and the basic of the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, remember, uh, people don't know what they don't know. Uh, I know my online ed team and, and folks around the institution have, have been reminded of this left and right. Um, uh, to, to, to inform a student, click on this link or download this file. It's easy enough for us to say if we do that every day, students don't understand that. Our colleagues don't understand what we're talking about sometimes. We really need to be, be uh, conscious uh, to unpack our jargon. Uh, I think in many institutions, uh, as I said, we're, we've gone from supporting a small portion of the institution to uh, everyone. Uh, it, we're, we're, we're interfacing with folks uh, who haven't come to our training for years and years. Uh, they haven't uh, understood what OER is. They haven't understood what open licenses are. They don't, haven't understood what the technology is uh, to teach online. So uh, keep that, that KISS principle in mind. Next slide, please. Um, James, we have just hit 345, Perfect. so um, before we go on to the next slide, we do want to um, step in and just um, join in solidarity with others who right now are taking a moment of silence um, and reflection to honor the life of George Floyd and recognize the violence that was leveled at him and the violence that is, is and has been leveled at Black folks. Um, for a very, very long time. So please join with us in one more minute of silence. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's carry that with us for the rest of the day and every step moving forward. Um, James, I'm gonna flip the slide and uh, hand it back over to you for some additional words of wisdom. Thank you, Ivy, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in that moment of silence publicly and with uh, members of my community. I really appreciate that. So words of advice in regards to the transition to online learning and supporting online learning with open educational resources. Uh, if you are not familiar with the concept of humanizing online learning, please become familiar with that concept. A shout out to Michelle Pekonsky Brock from California Community Colleges who uh, has promoted that phrase and that approach. Uh, we don't want our students to be taught by robots. Students don't wanna be taught by robots. They don't wanna be taught by commercial publishing products. Uh, we don't want them to be taught by simple products. We want them to be taught by people. Uh, so there's some great, great strategies out there to humanize uh, online teaching and learning. Uh, also, uh, while you're doing that, remember that uh, faculty and students, our colleagues, they need just in time training and support, no matter uh, how much we may have planned. Uh, our students and our faculty colleagues are dealing with the world, whether it's the world um, that inflicts violence on people uh, in the name of the state, or it's the stress of dealing with the pandemic. Um, people are ready when they're ready. They're ready to learn when they're ready. So we need to be ready to support them. Uh, and again, a caution about prioritizing expediency over equity. Um, to ignore 
uh, the incredible diversity and array of free, openly licensed resources that are available today, particularly for the community college level courses. Uh, I, I, I don't want to overstate it and say it borders on, you know, willful negligence, but it's, it's willful, I don't know, I I ignorance of the inequities that we see in our classrooms. Uh, utilizing OER and humanizing online learning is a way to bring more people into our educational opportunities. And uh, uh, those are ways to bring people into the opportunities that are promised and often not delivered. Um, so with that, I would encourage you all to use the OER that my team at uh, College of the Canyons has produced. Uh, if you're looking for community college level, uh, lower division, uh, open textbooks ranging from anthropology and astronomy to water technology and lots of courses in between, check out our OER website and you're free to use those textbooks now. And I will end again pointing us back to the voice of our students, trust our students, um, understand where our students are coming from and what they are telling us through, uh, through the opportunities we give them or don't give them to tell us. Thanks very much. James, thank you so much for your worth of advice and all of the resources that you shared. Um, really, really helpful to folks here with us. Um, Amy, I am very happy to hand the mic over to you. Okay, um, I'm Amy Hoffer with Open Oregon Educational Resources, which is the statewide OER program in Oregon. Thanks so much for including me. And um, I just uh, want to note that we're coming up on the hour in this session, I believe goes until 1.30, but um, for folks that do need to drop away, it's being recorded and the slides will be available. So if you need to catch up later, you can. Um, Open Oregon Educational Resources promotes textbook affordability for community college and university students and facilitates widespread adoption of open, low-cost, high-quality materials. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the OER coordinator for Oregon's 17 community colleges and seven universities. Oregon has about 260,000 community college students by headcount. And um, I really liked the um, demographics that Una mentioned earlier. And I think that one of the things that really pops out to me looking at our data in Oregon is that 50% um, of our community college students are early or mid-career non-traditional students. Um, we really don't have that many, you know, 18-year-old high school graduates heading straight into community colleges here in Oregon, um, you know, as in other states. And, um, you know, we've really got people in really different stages of their lives and juggling a variety of responsibilities and with a wide variety of academic goals that they're showing up for. Um, and um, what we're finding, um, you know, as in other states, is that COVID-19 is exposing inequity in access to the tools that um, our students need for remote learning, whether that might be devices or Wi-Fi or space to focus. Um, and you know, we're seeing other kinds of inequity that's really weighing on everybody's mind right now, whether people are using open or traditionally copyrighted materials, you know, um, removing the cost barrier doesn't automatically make those materials more equitable or fully accessible or representative of our diverse communities. So um, I'm, as James said, I'm grateful to be thinking about these issues with my community right now. So let's go to the next slide. Um, in terms of the um, pivot to remote learning that we had to do this spring, um, the strategies that emerged um, in my program in Oregon, um, the very first thing that I realized I needed to do was just take a less is more approach to open education. Faculty were really flooded with information, especially right um, at during spring break and during our spring term, we're on quarters in Oregon. Um, and so people that know me know that I like to send a lot of emails, but I um, really put some thought into um, holding back and being very targeted when I did send email in order to not contribute to the information overload. 
Um, and now that we have um, made our way through um, that really big rush to pivot during spring term, um, and we're starting to have a little bit of breathing room as we head into summer and prep for fall, um, we're finding that during the pivot, we might have made some decisions in a big hurry that we might want to revisit or redo um, as we get ready for fall. So we did a redesign in spring term, and now do we need to do a re-redesign, at least of some components for our courses? Um, so one thing about open educational resources that I want to mention is um, most are born digital and they're available for free online, but they're also available in print at low cost. So, um, you know, if, if faculty are looking for ways to make sure that everybody has access, um, maybe that means this summer really diving into understanding how to make print copies available to students who need them, um, you know, to give one example. Um, Another issue that came up, as Una mentioned, is um, we saw some, um, you know, special offers or special cases of fair use in order to provide emergency access to copyrighted all rights reserved course materials this spring. And those offers or those fair use arguments aren't necessarily going to be available once we move out of emergency mode. Um, and so I've got um, a link to some copyright guidance from the um, Open Oregon Educational Resources FAQ um, that can um, help people understand why choosing open course materials can be a more sustainable um, decision for the long term rather than kind of turning into a pretzel with a short term solution. Um, and one more thing that I wanted to mention, I saw the question um, that somebody asked about um, long-term access, you know, building a reference shelf for your um, future career. Um, and I, I just wanted to take a second to um, say that that's such a good point. Um, and with open educational resources, the open license gives permission to retain the resources. And this is a really important permission um, from the student perspective, it's like the opposite of a rental. You can keep your course materials forever. Um, from the faculty perspective, it means that if you adopt an open educational resource, you can download and save a local copy and not depend on a third party server that is bound to go down during midterms when everybody is in a crisis about it. So um, I just wanted to respond to that um, question in the Q&A while I'm here. So let's go to the um, next slide. Um, in terms of advice, um, the first piece of advice I would give is to, um, you know, let's be gentle with ourselves. Um, realizing that you've been delayed by the pandemic is a totally fine answer to where you're at with your OER goals right now. Um, in terms of who's here, I think we have a pretty big range of expertise from um, beginners and all the way um, across the spectrum of um, people that are really familiar with using open educational resources and if things needed to go on pause this spring, I think that that's really fine. And now we've got a little bit more breathing room to look around us. Um, faculty I'm hearing anecdotally who were already using open educational resources heading into spring term felt like they were ahead. Um, their students already had access to the course content. They didn't need to make a special fair use argument um, to make sure that their students had the learning materials that they needed. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping to capture some testimonials from those faculty if I can, and I hope that others will as well, because um, for faculty and instructors to hear from their colleagues is very powerful. Um, and um, I would also just say, like, if we aren't able to capture those testimonials, that's also fine. It's hard to ask faculty to do one more thing right now. Um, and um, the last thing I just wanted to say is that, um, you know, students are really feeling the um, hardship of the pandemic right now in terms of um, health impacts and economic impacts and all the ripple effects that are happening. This is the right time to make changes that are going to help our students manage their budget. So thank you to everybody on the call for what you're doing for students and for really keeping student success in mind. So thank you. 
Thank you, Amy. Really appreciate your words um, and sharing a little bit of context for us um, from Oregon. That's really helpful. Um, and now for our last presenter of the day, we are very excited to have Matthew Bloom here. Matthew, I'm going to pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Matthew Bloom. I am English faculty at Scottsdale Community College, which is in the Maricopa Community Colleges District, which is the Phoenix area of Arizona, United States. Um, I am actually on full reassignment. This is my third year as the Open Educational Resource Coordinator for the entire Maricopa Community College District, which has 10 separately accredited colleges, all connected by a district uh, leadership, district administration. Um, and we have approximately 200,000 students a year across those colleges, uh, 1,400 faculty, you know, residential faculty. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a beast, you know, and so the coordinating uh, something like that can be somewhat challenging because a lot of it is just trying to figure out what people are doing and what they need in terms of access to resources or um, if not OER, then at least low cost or no cost alternatives to the kind of costly uh, traditional textbooks. What we have been doing since 2013 is um, the Maricopa Millions OER project which has focused on getting faculty to adapt and adopt open educational resources in their classrooms, across their departments, and then ideally also um, fostering collaborative partnerships between faculty across the colleges so that we can kind of maximize the impact that we're making. Um, what we have also been doing is we do a lot of student outreach events across the colleges where we'll set up um, at Kind of high traffic areas and of course this is pre-COVID but we would set up and, and engage directly with students and, and uh, in terms of discussing the the cost of the access to the learning materials um, you know what they do in order you know when they see that a textbook costs a lot of money a lot of students will actually drop a class or they'll just do whatever they can do to just not buy the book at all so it's great uh, rapport building experience also uh, to, to do that with your to engage with your students in that way um, but we, we have a team, and this is one of the takeaways I think that I always like to try to, um, any kind of talk I ever do about um, OER and about how to make an OER initiative work. I mean, I can't really pretend like I designed the Maricopa Familias Initiative. I, I basically inherited something that was already working well, and I'm doing my best to maintain it. And I wouldn't be able to do it if it weren't for a team that we have of administrators, faculty, instructional designers, IT from across our district. And so we all work together. And we are a very diverse district as well. Um, and our students, when it comes to what they are looking for, what they need, and this is pre-COVID still, um, we had, we are still, but we had been working for a couple of years on a massive transformation to a guided pathways model to provide our students with the suite of support necessary to, uh, you know, basically from the first day when they enroll to, you know, completing their degree or credential at the end making sure that they have all the resources that are needed and that they have the direction that's there. And part of that, uh, we've tried our best throughout that process to embed open educational resources into that mission because access to the learning materials is uh, central to student success in, in many ways. And I think we've already kind of discussed that. Um, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, I think I can kind of contextualize this a little bit more. Now that we have, uh, Found, found ourselves in a, in a crisis situation. One of, I would say, probably the most important strategies that we have tried to employ is just continuing to do, to do what we were doing before, right? So consistency despite all things. For example, we provide faculty grant opportunities. We provide faculty training opportunities to learn about OER. Uh, we provide them with support when they have questions and, and, and our, our network, uh, you know, folks on our team across the colleges are really able to provide that. And we wanted to keep that going. So uh, there were a few, day, a few ways in which we wanted to do that. We kept offering the grants. We continued to, we started thinking about how we can offer prof professional development and trainings um, online, which we had wanted to do in the first place already. And I can't really speak for all instructors at all or for other institutions. But I would say one thing about practitioners of open education is that they tend to be already prepared to teach online, or at least they tend to be already um, prepared to, uh, you know, deliver some sort of instruction in a digital way and in ways that are non-traditional. Um, and so, you know, we want to continue to support that, whether it's 
um, having students engaged in renewable assignments where they are kind of co-creating the, the curriculum for the course or co-creating knowledge generally um, along with the instructors, those kinds of learning experiences for students, we wanted to try to continue to promote that. And so there's two specific things um, that I would say in terms of the feature strategies that we had to actually kind of tweak a little bit or things that we changed slightly to meet the increasing demand uh, for access to online materials, access to open materials during the crisis. And so one of those things was we saw, so the context obviously I think we all know, but we had many faculty that were scrambling to transition to online. Now, some of those faculty were already initiated into this open educational resources mystery, and those faculty were able to um, take over, or, or, or I should say, assume a mentoring role. So if we had faculty members who, during this time of crisis, were you know, trying to make all these changes to their courses, we wanted to identify those faculty who we felt were prepared to grow into some sort of a leadership position or to give them the opportunity to share their expertise with some of the other faculty members in our district who may be in a different discipline, maybe at a different college, uh, who are not initiated into OER and are struggling in this like crisis moment to try to find materials online for their students. So what we did was we looked back through our roster of all of the um, faculty and staff that we've had go through our trainings and earn our OER practitioner credential or our OER maker badge. So those are two different badges that we've offered, one of which is, uh, is the result of a seven part workshop and uh, the other is the result of basically creating and publishing OER. And so what we did was we kind of went to them and we asked that group of experienced practitioners if they would be willing to serve as mentors for some people who might be just starting their journey into open education at this crisis time. And um, so far, um, it's, it, we had some interest, in fact, we had more interest from those who were uh, interested in being mentors than those who were interested in being mentees. And as Amy and some other folks have kind of uh, alluded to, there's a lot of stuff going on, so we, we didn't want to introduce too many new things. But this is an opportunity for us to kind of build out the leadership strength uh, in terms of, of how open education is practiced across our district, while also providing support uh, to people who may have questions in a way that is somewhat sustainable. I mean, there's not any funding involved in this and it really is just a, it's one of, it's kind of like an informal mentor mentee relationship. You just kind of connect two people because of the fact that one of them has experience that the other may benefit from and the, the, the two parties get together and basically how they interact in terms of the mentorship is, is really up to them. But the other thing, and this is something that has garnered a lot more attention, um, it is the OER emergency grants, which we decided to offer. We were going to do, we had some trainings and we had uh, some physical events that we were going to be planning, or that we were planning for this summer and that we had to cancel. And so since we had additional money in our budget, we decided we would focus that money um, in a way that would make it really easy, relatively easy, for faculty to get a small grant. There were two tiers to these grants. One was $350 and the other was $700. So that's approximately the equivalent of 10 clock hours and 20 clock hours based on how uh, the contracts are paid in our district. So what we did was we wanted to make it simple for faculty who are in this moment creating materials uh, that they are then going, you know, in order to provide their students with the content online. We know a lot of people are scrambling to make stuff or find stuff. And what we wanted to do was not, you know, they don't have time to like write the whole course right now. But what they might have time to do is, is they might find that the additional money um, is incentive enough for them to take the extra steps to ensure that number one, they are not relying on what's already been kind of commented on here previously, which is not relying on stuff that's free now but won't be free later. We also wanted to encourage them to make sure that they were creating or adapting materials in a way that was um, ethical and legal, right, according to copyright and intellectual, intellectual property, um, so that those materials could then be shared in the future as well, so that it's actually a contribution to the materials that we let, that we consider our catalog, which by the way, this link goes to our OER emergency grant, but if you are a Canvas uh, uh, user, you can go to Canvas Commons and type in M-M-O-E-R, uh, that's the search tag that you can use to find the materials that a lot of our faculty have um, self-published over the last few years. 
Um, so the OER emergency grants have been a really great opportunity. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, I will just kind of finish up with a couple of quick things. Um, what I have found, and I'm sure that this is not profound, but it's really important to uh, work with other institutions, not just within your institution, obviously cross-discipline, cross, discipline, cross uh, different kind of stakeholders is always important too. But one of the best things that, that I've found is working with CCC OER, working with people from College of the Canyons, working with um, uh, Montgomery College and Quantum Polytechnic right now, we have a, a partnership going on with an open pedagogy fellowship. And so these kinds of opportunities spread out the workload and maximize the impact in a way that I think is really great. I also want to stress that this is the second point here. This is, you know, a lot of times I think we are, um, a lot of times I think that we underestimate our students and it is important for us to remember that while some of them are not capable of doing things, that's just like it is with all humans. And believe me, I work with faculty and people all the time. I'm faculty myself. And I know that, that we all have our, our kind of, um, points where we're just kind of don't get something but students are actually many times very capable of succeeding in an online environment they're already growing up in a world where they are constantly sharing and creating online so we can harness that and we can really use that as an opportunity to reflect what it means to be uh, digitally literate or literate at all in uh, the 21st century and then finally don't pressure faculty it really is about advocacy and committing to provide support but as soon as faculty feel like they're being pressured, see there's my alarm going off. As soon as faculty feel pre uh, pressured, then that is when um, there tends to be a lot of tension. So I would strongly recommend avoiding that. And that's it. Matthew, thank you so much. It was really wonderful to hear everything that's going on at Maricopa and the many ways that you're supporting other faculty members um, and members of the, the greater college community at large. Um, so folks, we are moving into question time and my wonderful colleague Iris Palmer will um, be moderating a discussion. Um, so if you haven't sent in any questions that have come to mind for you, please feel free to do that right now and we'll get to it. All right, Iris. Thanks so much, Ivy. Uh, my name is Iris Palmer. I'm a senior advisor for higher education and the workforce here at New America. And you all have asked a ton of questions already, and I'm really excited to get started in this conversation. First, I'd just like to reiterate that um, all the resources that have been mentioned by people um, presenting today, as well as the presentation with the embedded links, will be provided on the website and we'll be able to send out um, the recording, the presentation and the resources to people who participated in this webinar today. So thank you so much for all the questions about the amazing resources that our panelists have pointed out. Um, they will absolutely be available to you and you should be able to go in and access them at your leisure. So my first question is for Maria, and I think I know the answer to this one, Maria, but um, somebody just wanted clarification. Uh, can uh, institutions outside of the United States access and use the resources on Skills Commons? Yes, in fact, um, most countries across the globe are accessing Skills Commons. I think there are about eight countries that haven't tapped into us yet but um, we've got some pretty wide exposure. That's wonderful. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate that clarification. Um, so the next one is for uh, Sharon. Sharon, uh, you talked a little bit about um, the, how the faculty can vet open educational resources. This person was wondering if there was a particular um, website or a place to go for, um, for resources that have been vetted by faculty already. Um, so thanks for the question. Um, so I'll, let me just clarify a couple of things. So first, um, I wasn't, tr I think that I may not have been clear. I wasn't suggesting that there um, was necessarily one place that had a lot of resources that had been vetted. Um, obviously, um, we've been on a call with a lot of like um, really great projects that were mentioned and all of those I would consider materials that are vetted by the faculty members either at Maricopa or at any of the um, colleges that were mentioned. Um, so please, like one of the things about open education is that the resources are freely available um, without copyright restriction to people. So please take those as um, um, instead of, you know, starting from scratch. Um, I think that the quality, com um, 
comment I made was more to suggest that, um, for example, if you purchased a textbook and you noticed that there was an error, um, you would have to wait for the publisher to issue errata and it would take a little while. Um, versus with something that you have the direct copyright control over, you can um, find out the information and make the edits um, just um, in that moment, um, or as you're ready, or once you've researched it, or if there's materials that are outdated, um, you can make the corrections. So for example, in K-12, to a lot of times, you know, like students are taught out of books that are purchased on an eight-year cycle. So, you know, is Pluto a planet? Yes, it was, and then it wasn't, and then it sort of was something else. Um, who's the president of the United States? Um, and, you know, a lot of those um, little bits of inaccuracies are incorrect because of just passage of time. And to be able to, in the moment, adjust that information to update it and to keep it current is um, a really, was, I think, the point that I was trying to make. So thanks for helping me clarify that. Thank you for clarifying that. And the next um, question is also for you. And that is um, the example that you shared with the USAID um, grantee and the, I believe it was a um, pilot uh, or aviation um, mm -hmm. uh, resource. Can you share which country that was? Yes, um, that was for Mexico, and I dropped it in the chat, the link to the project. So RUDIS was a USAID funded grant program that focused on um, workforce development for youth and youth being, you know, not just like K to 12, but also the technical high school and the technical college system. And so that one of their grantees was is the international, uh, the form for the, sorry, I I can't remember. It's FYI, I think <laughs> the International yeah. Foundation for Youth, and um, they were the USAID grantees that worked with Air Washington um, grantees to figure out all of this stuff. I really appreciate that. And last question for you. Can you give us any more information about the um, way that the textbook pilot um, sites might be selected this time around? Will it substantially change in any way? Um, I think that um, one of the things that I can send you is our um, notice of proposed priorities. And we did um, receive a number of comments and we did ask some very specific questions about um, just for feedback on what worked last time, what didn't work. Um, and so we are sifting through those questions and the responses that we got and we are having a number of questions just about that. So thank you to everyone who contributed. Um, it helps us in our thinking a lot. And um, we estimate that later in the summer, we should have the final priorities and the announcement available. Thank you so much. We will absolutely share that in our resource section. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for, for answering those questions. Um, James, somebody is curious about um, the survey tool or questionnaire you used with your students. Um, is that accessible to others? And I mean, I'm assuming it is, but hopefully it is. Uh, and is it, can it be used for knowing about technology access related concerns as well as learning challenges concerns? Yes, I, I saw that question in, 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 in the Q&A and I was so happy to see it. I just want to uh, double check with our institutional research folks who created that survey, but I will place in the chat uh, a link to the survey results uh, 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 as part of a slideshow that was shared publicly at my institution. So one can certainly extract from that what the questions were, but I'll, I'll check in with our institutional research folks about uh, sharing the actual, actual instrument. Thanks, James. And we will also share that in our resources on the website. Okay, um, so the next um, message I think Amy actually addressed or the next question, which was how um, we can utilize, how we can sort of store and curate OER texts and um, learning pieces for future reference for students as they go into their careers. I don't, just wanted to open this up and if anyone else wanted to comment and, and answer that question about how to do that well. I just unmute your uh, microphone if you're interested. If not, we'll move on. Ah, James. Yeah, I, I, I will repeat what I, what I uh, wrote in the chat. And that is one of the fabulous things about openly licensed content. I think both Sharon and Amy mentioned this, is, is the right to retain the content. So 
Uh, certainly in, in, in a lot of the trades fields or career education fields, we understand that folks want, students might want to retain those materials uh, as a future reference in their profession. Well, OER certainly permits you to do that much, much more easily than, uh, than uh, commercial content that's, that's hidden behind a paywall. Really appreciate that, James. And I'm sorry if we're repeating things that were in the chat. <laughs> I hope I don't know if any, everybody saw that. It's um, I think it's still very helpful to actually openly discuss it. Um, so the next one is actually about uh, encouraging faculty adoption, which was it, which was actually addressed by several of you. But I just want to give you an opportunity uh, to readdress it. Um, and this person says, uh, as a librarian, a number of times, the number of times I've struggled with convincing and motivating faculty about OER as an authentic and reliable resource. Because a number of them have published their articles with publishers, which are not open access, faculty is finding it difficult to acknowledge this idea. How do you convince faculty to consider OER as a reliable resource and a source of learning? Una? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to take that one. Um, you know, when I um, give workshops to faculty about this, I take them to the OER repositories and I show them the peer reviews that are done by faculty um, in higher ed institutions. And um, I tell them about the process of developing those materials. Um, so most of our OER repositories have that have a peer review process and and many of their resources are review are peer reviewed and and you can read those online OpenStax has a slightly different policy so that i think many of you know about OpenStax, which has over 37 textbooks um, focused on introductory courses and and business and they actually do the peer review during production um, of their um, textbooks so i i really point that out and then the other piece that I talk about is how effective is it for students? And so looking at the OER research, so I bring in OER research that has been done that shows that students who are taking courses uh, that use OER instead of traditional textbooks are doing as well and sometimes better than students in traditional uh, courses. So I think you know trying to balance that because it's a legitimate question to ask. Exactly. Matthew, I know you were unmuted. Did you want to follow up? Well, I have to say that Una really nailed it there. The only thing, I mean, that's pretty much what I was going to say about, especially uh, the peer review that goes into some of the work that OpenStax and, and some of the other repositories do uh, put into it. But I wanted to add as well that there is a student success um, component to um, considering open education resources, especially if you're partnering with other faculty in your discipline to not necessarily completely rethink, but at least uh, reapproach the way that you are providing the materials to your students. And, and here's what I guess the long story short is, is, you know, the process of reapproaching your curriculum and redesigning potentially some of your materials uh, in order to find kind of the open access alternative to whatever you're using, that process oftentimes yields the discovery that there are unnecessary things happening in the classroom and that may be distracting from the actual competencies that, that you should be addressing. And so, I'm, you know, faculty, this is not just, um, you know, my own experience, but there's, there, there are published articles about this out there as well, where, where people go, they redesign their curriculum to be OER or they adopt new OER and they align everything towards learning outcomes and they discover that there were inconsistencies. Now, academic freedom is very important and we always want to protect that, but it may, it may very well be that you discover that there is something in the traditional approach that has not been working. And the way that you discover that is by kind of pulling away at that access issue and looking at the materials that you're actually using. So that's not. Oh, it looks like we lost Matthew, but I think he was wrapping up. James, did you want to add anything? I, I certainly do, of course. Yeah, Ma Matthew Noon has certainly na nailed it. I would also add, uh, you know, our, our faculty are academics. They're, they're uh, uh, scientists. They follow the data. So let's share with them the data. Share with them the data. Uh, that I think Matthew was getting ready to, to talk about uh, uh, from studies and programs all over the United States that show that uh, when OER is utilized, student success increases. And it increases particularly amongst students from traditionally under-resourced populations. 
and so also add this add data around uh, from your students about hunger and homelessness. I hope, for goodness sakes, your institutions are all collecting data about around hunger and homelessness and and uh, bar barriers that your students encounter. Well, ask the students what what uh, what they think about textbooks, and then drill down into the different populations. You know, which which populations tell you that the cost of textbooks is a barrier? Which populations tell you that that not seeing themselves reflected in the textbooks is a barrier to learning? And let, let your faculty, you know, follow follow their their uh, their academic inquiry. That's really helpful, James. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take uh, my uh, privilege as the moderator and skip around a little bit. And um, Matthew, you talked about your uh, emergency grant program, and you talked about a bunch of staff at the Maricopa College System who support the implementation of OER. Um, I think there's some questions around how institutions can get resources to create those ty that type of programming. Um, and so I'd love to open it up for you to talk a little bit about how colleges can think about um, resourcing both grants and staff. Well, that is, that, well, I, will, I will say that we are um, currently and have been for several years now, extremely privileged in Maricopa to have buy-in from our district administration, from our governing board, um, all, and then all the way down to faculty. So the, the way that it started with, with Maricopa was faculty were on the ground in the classroom using open educational resources um, and kind of advocating for those things. And the district recognized that and found that it would, and took kind of like the, made an investment um, and we were able to take the money that we were given. And it's a pretty big district. So again, that there, there's the privilege of having access to those resources in the first place. Um, but we were able to take that, that funding and quantify, um, at least in terms of an estimate, the actual cost savings or the cost savings that we, we estimate students were uh, experiencing as a result of it. And so while I can't tell you how to find money if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your institution doesn't have the funding to give faculty those things that there are some strategies I would say if, if you don't have the resources um, embed open education into what's already there or it you know find support in the libraries find support in the centers for teaching and learning um, and you may find that people are actually willing when they when they start to understand the, the promise of open education they may actually um, you might not need extra money it might just be a matter of reassigning time um, and reprioritizing but if you do have that funding, I think it's really, really important if you want your administration, and I, you know, James is an administrator, he's on here, I'm sure he will support this. They, they want to know what, where's the proof that this is actually having an impact, right? So if you, you know, one of the ways that we try to do that is we think, okay, well, there's X number of students on average in a given class, uh, an average textbook costs a certain amount, whatever. We multiply those two together and then we multiply it by the number of sections in our system that are coded as either no cost or low cost resources. So we know that the students are paying less than $40 for their course materials. And mo most of those courses actually are zero cost. Um, and we're able to kind of do that calculation and it's loose, it's an estimate, but it's pretty conservative for a number of reasons, which I'm happy to address separately, to not take the time now. But we estimate that our students since 2013 have probably saved about $20 million on course materials in our district. And so when we need to ask for money and we say, hey, I need an extra, can I have an extra $50,000 this year to give a bunch of grants to faculty? We just have to quantify it and say, well, look, I mean, every it just takes one faculty member to change their five classes to OER and you've got like a $200,000 savings, you know, in one year because of all the students that that one decision to change can make. So I would say quantify it. And if you don't have the funding, see if there's a way that you can start to embed that uh, culture in what it already exists. Oh, looks like we lost Matthew again. Um, James, I know you wanted to follow up. Yeah, I, I agree with everything my, my friend Matthew said. I would just add, as, as the administrator here, there's always money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but budgets are a reflection of values. Uh, your institution, my institution, we spend money left and right. What do we value? Do we value student success? Do we, do we value culturally relevant pedagogy? Do we value inclusiveness? Let's invest our money in that. So as Matthew said, uh, uh, frame the OER uh, initiative in terms of other things that are valued on campus 
and, and make those connections. Compelling argument, James. Now, Amy, I'm going to give you the last word and then we're going to close out. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, just to weigh in and say that we're really looking at an uncertain time going forward in terms of funding um, at every level and, um, you know, dollar, it might get really competitive for um, funding for even something as important as making higher education more affordable and the kinds of really exciting um, outcomes that Matthew talked about, you know, $20 million in student savings is so awesome. And it feels so urgent to get those kinds of results. And what I've noticed is that sometimes it can take a really long time to see an impact. You know, somebody will take a workshop and then they'll approach me like three years later and say, I finally adopted and guess what? My whole department did too, right? So um, I think that really um, knowing that we're in it for the long game and um, being prepared to start the conversations and start building the relationships um, to eventually see those results that we want to see in terms of student savings and student success. Um, you know, it feels like there's a lot of um, urgency around this work right now, and there is, but um, it might not be results oriented um, immediately. So just wanted to put in that caveat there. So we're playing the short game and the long game. I think that's really wise, Amy. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody who joined us today. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and your comments. Um, and we, once again, will post the uh, PowerPoint online. You will be able to access all the links. We will, access, we will put a list of all the resources online. And we will uh, put a, a recording of the webinar itself online. And we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thanks to all of our panelists for your wonderful wisdom. <laughs>